Our first speaker this time will be Charles Epstein uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is a fine institution. I apologize for my crack to Alan. I just couldn't help myself. Um, <laughs> where he's been majoring in experimental particle and nuclear physics under the guidance of Richard Milner. Um, he did his practicum at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and will talk to us about electron-electron interactions. Charles. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about uh, my thesis work, which has been studying the electron-electron interaction. Um, so first, I'd like to start off by thanking all of my collaborators. Um, this has been a really fun project over the last five years, and um, had a lot of help from uh, a number of great people uh, at my home institution. So before getting into uh, all the details of what we've been doing, I'd like to start off with some theoretical background. Let's get this out of the way. So uh, electron scattering is a tool that we've used to study nuclei for, for decades. So it kind of got its start in around the 1940s. And some of those first experiments uh, were done at MIT by uh, Van de Graaff, Buckner, Feschbach, et al. And um, you know, here's Buckner and Feschbach uh, working on a machine that you may see later. Uh, and some of this, their first work was to show the validity of the Mott cross-section, uh, which is just, you know, we don't have enough energy to see any structure in the nucleus, so we just, you know, say it's like a point particle. And, you know, that worked for the most part. Later on, uh, electron scattering developed as a more powerful tool. So in 1955, Hofstadter discovered proton substructure. Uh, 1968, Freeman, Kendall, and Taylor uh, claimed discovery of the quark. And uh, nowadays, uh, oh, and here are some of the spec uh, giant spectrometers they used to discover the quark at SLAC. So nowadays, we do things like search for dark forces with electron beams. Uh, we can try to measure uh, the radius of the proton because that's, depending on how you measure it, you get totally different values and that's as yet unexplained. And we can also do some precision tests of the standard model such as uh, measuring the running of the weak mixing angle. And so modern accelerators are trading off some of the high energy to go to lower energy and higher precision and higher intensity beams. So, uh, kind of back up a little bit, you know, the incoming electron can come in and scatter off the nucleus, and a lot of times we call this elastic scattering, which is really a misnomer, and, or it can come in, scatter off the electron, and we call that Mahler scattering. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a lot today about Mahler scattering. So Mahler scattering is a natural baseline for studies of the nucleus using electron scattering, because, you know, you're trying to measure some really complicated interaction between the electron and the nucleus, and you know, you may not know exactly how many atoms are in your target, you might not know exactly how many electrons are in your beam, but you know exactly the ratio of electrons in your target to nuclei in your target. So that's a really nice normalization process. So this all means that you need to understand that electron-electron interaction really precisely. And, and it's simple, I mean, this is QED, we've been able to calculate this in theory for years, decades, um, and the way we do it is by using Feynman diagrams. And we evaluate this cross-section uh, by going perturbatively in the number of vertices. So this might be a review for some, but I just want to kind of go over it a little bit. Uh, you know, at leading order, uh, you know, electron comes in, exchanges a photon with another electron, and they scatter out. And uh, over here on the right is sort of a Franken diagram of like a whole bunch of different processes that can happen. So you can have vacuum polarization, which is this loop in the middle. You can have changes to the magnetic moment. You can have uh, radiation, or so radiative scattering. These are all things that you can that can happen to. Uh, and when you start going to higher precision, you have to think about. Uh, so normally we take these one at a time, but radiative corrections are kind of surprisingly complicated and. Uh, it becomes a total whack-a-mole of divergences. Like every time you solve one diagram, it's divergent, and you have to think about other stuff, and you just keep going back and forth, and eventually you stop and say it's good enough. So, so the method we do, uh, we do something called a slicing method where we look at the radiation. And um, turns out, because of some of these divergences, you have to take into, if you want to look at loop effects, you have to look at radiative effects at the same time because otherwise you can't cancel a divergence. So the 
photon is below some cutoff energy we call delta E. We say it's close enough to elastic kinematics that your detector wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And you just apply this correction factor, delta, to the cross-section. If your photon is higher than that delta E, then you actually have to think about um, what happens to the event. You have to use full inelastic kinematics. So back in you know, the 60s, when people started looking at this, uh, it gets really complicated really fast. And so people would just set the electron mass to zero, and then you get an expression that's like three lines. Whereas if you keep the electron mass, it's like three or four pages of like numerical integrals and all sorts of stuff. So people got rid of that. And um, that becomes a problem nowadays when we're trying to do things at lower energy and higher precision. So here's that delta correction term to your cross section. And it's a function of this delta E. And the dependence it has is that the bigger your window, the more events you expect. So the more energy you can lose and still think that your event's elastic, the more events you're going to see, naturally. And it turns out that actually doesn't work if you forget the electron mass. So if you, uh, this is delta E, and this is the radiative correction term. So when you include the electron mass, it's always increasing. Bigger window, more counts. If you neglect the electron mass, it goes the other way, which is like saying the wider your search, the fewer events you see, which is just impossible. And it's like saying you have a negative probability density, which doesn't work for this kind of stuff. Um, so again, the first calculation of this radiative correction was 1960, and only in 2010 did someone actually fix it. Um, all three years of LEP and slack, and, you know, no one ever needed it. So nowadays, we really start to uh, really start to care about that. So my home institution, I come from the dark light experiment, which um, you don't need to know too much about dark light. They're looking for dark forces, but Muller scattering was a background for them. So you have an experiment with a hydrogen target here. Everything's stuck in a solenoid. So your electron beam is 100 MeV, comes in scatters off the hydrogen and creates a ton of molar electrons. And the, you try to focus them out of the way of your detectors, but they hit this beam dump, scatter backwards, cause noise in your detector. They can also radiate photons internally from Bremsstrahlung. And it turns out the rate of like, junk that you see in your detector arising from photons from radiative molar scattering is about the same as like, electron hydrogen scattering. Electron nuclear, electron proton scattering. Like it's an insanely high rate. So they wanted to understand this better. And that's kind of where we got started. Aside from that, um, there's an experiment at Jefferson Lab now called PRAD that's trying to measure the proton radius. And this is really forward angle electron proton scattering that they normalize to Muller scattering. And at forward angles, you also get that problem with the flipped sign. Um, there are also a bunch of future low-energy accelerators, so uh, 100 MeV scale. Uh, there's one being built in Germany, in Mainz, called MESA. And there's one uh, being built at Cornell right now. Uh, it's called C-beta. So one of the first things we did um, was we, you know, we fixed uh, the Bremsstrahlung part of it, because you need to match the two uh, sections of phase space. Um, so we put together something that is the full uh, NLO QED radiative corrections. Um, so new exact Bremsstrahlung. Uh, we did it for a whole bunch of processes with light leptons. Uh, kept the electron mass at all levels, so no problems from that. And we uh, put this together into something called a Monte Carlo event generator, which enables Monte Carlo simulations of your detector using this process. OK, so we, uh, we made this generator, and you want to test it, but no one's really started to look at that yet. So you can compare to other software, but you really want to compare to data. And it turns out that no one's actually taken precise data at low energies like this or in this region, because no one's really cared about it until now. So the idea is we want to measure the electron momentum spectrum and look at how the radiation occurs. Uh, and because all of those radiative corrections are tied together, if we can understand the momentum spectrum, we can kind of bootstrap knowledge of the rest of it. So that's, that's the important part. Uh, so we look at low energies. We look at scattering angles that are relatively high, and you can't neglect the electron mass here. And this means we need to measure the momentum of 
electrons that have really low energy, like a couple MeV. So um, we use an experiment that looks something like this. Uh, an electron beam comes in, hits a diamond-like carbon foil target. Uh, the electrons scatter out, and we catch them in a magnetic spectrometer. And we put a focal plane detector here. And this is pretty small. It's about a foot in radius. Uh, so this is what the uh, layout looks like. Electrons come in here. We have a target ladder apparatus. We have a movable spectrometer arm. Focal plane detector comes up here. And you know, we can just push the spectrometer to different angles and check them all out. Since these are such low energy electrons, the whole system has to stay under vacuum. So we have a bellows that, lets us, uh, that we designed to let us uh, move things around and not ever have to break vacuum. This is the apparatus assembled at the MIT Bates Laboratory. Um, so it's, they even got the colors right from the, uh, from the SOLIDWORKS model. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is our target ladder apparatus. So one thing we have on here is a beryllium oxide screen. When electrons hit that, it lights up purple. And you can see what your beam spot looks like. And these are our 1, 2, and 5 micron uh, carbon foil targets. We actually don't have the 1 micron one anymore because it evaporated. Like disintegrated instantly, so we have we have nothing two and five. Yeah. yeah. Um, the focal plane detector is an array of scintillating tiles. So these are half millimeter thick scintillators, uh, uh, two and a half millimeters wide and either you know five or fifteen centimeters long. And we had these uh, custom manufactured for us by Elgin Technology. And we have two layers. They're uh, like a stereo layer, so the particle goes through and you measure a coincidence, and that tells you the hit position. And um, we, we read them out with uh, two millimeter psi PMs. We wanted to do some testing, so we had to make a, a test stand for the, for the detector. And um, what we really wanted is to be able to put the tiles in uh, a tile holder and then put in a set screw to hold it in place to test it. And this is something with a lot of like holes and square things and stuff like that. So we went to 3D print it. And we tried a ton of different, a bunch of different methods, uh, standard FDM printers, um, which are these, uh, an SLS printer, Polyjet. None of them could reproduce the small features. So these are, compared to the printers we saw at Livermore uh, the other day, this is like easy. But for us with no budget, this was non-trivial. <laughs> Eventually, we settled on a, a Formlabs SLA printer, and that's what was able to reproduce the detail we needed. Um, so fibers come in, put in a set screw, holds them in place, and you can optically couple it to a PM board. This is the detector you know, assembled. Essentially, this is another 3D printed frame that has a lot of cool features like hexagonal countersinks to um, you know, allow you to attach everything and not create any dead area. Uh, we have in-house designed uh, front-end boards with amplifiers, discriminators, and it, we just have a digital output to a TDC. So it's a pretty streamlined data acquisition system. And here it is mounted to the, the main spectrometer. So we started installing all this um, about a year ago. So. We were originally going to run this experiment at Jefferson Lab in Virginia, which had a you know, 100 MeV beam, um, you know, really nice beam. But that opportunity went away. And we found an, the chance to do this experiment at the MIT High Voltage Research Lab. So this is a Van de Graaff accelerator, single-ended electron accelerator. Um, here's a grad student for scale next to the tank. Um, it was built by Robert Van de Graaff and John Trump back in the 40s. And um, it was moved to its current location in the 60s. And it operates like a machine from the 40s. So here's the control panel, um, uh, which is it's pretty, it's pretty cool, I think. Uh, all of the, these veins are all mechanical. And, um, a lot, and you know, everything's mechanical here. Like here are the beam energy controls. And this is the main power supply for the whole accelerator. It runs on vacuum tubes. Um, they're not lit up right now, but the whole thing buzzes and glows when you turn it on. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, so last June, um, we did our move-in. We had everything put together. We had to take it apart. Um, 
uh, one of our engineers taking the spectrometer off with the crane, taking off the target chamber. We loaded it up onto a truck. So this was built at Bates, which is like an hour drive from campus, and we had to bring it all down. And uh, everything comes into the lab on the ground floor, and our, we set up on the, in the basement. So everything has to fit through this hole. And um, this crane has like 500 pound capacity, so we had to break everything down into little pieces. And then once it gets into the basement, you can't, there's nothing to move it around with. We don't have a, a pallet jack or anything, so we actually build it in place. So this is the crane bringing it down and our engineering team just assembling it in place. And like this table has three legs, so if you do it wrong, it's gonna fall over and flip. And you'll have no way to put it back. So, <laughs> so we did our first run September 2017 uh, just to see what the beam looked like because we'd never done this before. So we used this beryllium oxide screen and to take a look. And you know, after like three or four days of optimization, it looked, oh, oh, this is what our setup looked like. And then the beam looked like this. And to give you a sense of scale, this is about an inch and a half high, this screen. And so that beam, beam spot is huge and that you can't do an experiment with that. Um, and you can't see it in the still picture, but it, is, it bounces around and drifts and like doesn't stay in the same place. So we had one quadrupole available and that focused it into a line. And so uh, some of you probably know you need two to make it into a spot. So we knew we actually needed two of those. So that's what we did next. We got two quadrupoles. We added some steering coils. We added a Faraday cup. Um, our engineering team put in, you know, a system where you can move the quadrupoles back and forth and figure out where they need to be. It looks like this now. So we have two sets of steering coils, two quadrupoles. Works a lot better. Um, these are some the steering coils we used. They're, um, they're pretty fun because you can just cable tie them to the beam line and they take like half an amp and they're, they're great. We found them unused. They were still in their packaging from like 25 years ago at Bates and we got them for free, so it was great. So everything takes optimization, and this is, we turned it on and started focusing it, and this is what our beam looked like. <laughs> and this is you know, great for a greeting card, but not so good for an experiment. <laughs> so um, you know, more days, time, turning all the different knobs, because you know, none of them are labeled and stuff like that. And we were able to pass the beam through this hole, which is about an eighth of an inch in diameter. So it's still not perfect. Like there's stuff, you know, that's non, you know, non-symmetric, but it's good enough for now. So you take some prelimin pre preliminary data and process it with some secret proprietary processing algorithm, not really, and it looks like this. Um, you do a simulation, looks a bit like that, and you put them together, it looks something like this. So this is using our new calculation and uh, a full Monte Carlo simulation and comparing it to the data. And I think it's pretty encouraging. Um, it's very preliminary so far, but the agreement across the spectrum is pretty good. There's some issue here. We don't really know what that is. But in general, um, I think it's a good direction. So the future outlook, our limiting factor is beam quality. Uh, this is the main bending magnet that brings the beam out into the horizontal plane. and it. Uh, we have some work to do on that. Um, we want to do some machine upgrades. We want to add improved diagnostics to know what the beam looks like as we're focusing it, because we only have like one measurement point right now. Um, if you can really push down the precision, if you can get below a percent, you can start to distinguish different models of radiative corrections. Um, so I talked about lead, uh, next to leading order, but if you want to go one order further, uh, there's no real agreed upon best practice for doing that. So we might be able to say something about that in the far future. And um, there's also support in the department to turn this into a pedagogical experiment and use it to teach undergrads uh, how to set up experiments and how to focus beams and take data. So that's where this is going in the future. So just to sum up, um, we're trying to, to uh, improve our understanding of electron-electron scattering to be good enough for a lot of precise modern experiments. So we did a, a new calculation, including the electron mass, 
we developed a Monte Carlo event generator to enable simulations. We've designed, constructed, installed a new experiment to test it. And I think the data so far are somewhat encouraging. And I'd like to sum up by saying uh, thank you uh, to the DOE, NNSA, and to Krell for four years of excellent support uh, with this fellowship. Um, it's been a pleasure. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you.